Part 1. You will hear a lecture about crocodiles. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. This week, we're going to be looking at some creatures with a ferocious reputation, the crocodile. The largest species of crocodile in the world is the saltwater or estuarine crocodile, which can be found in Southeast Asia and, more especially, in Northern Australia. This crocodile is the largest living reptile in the world, bar none. It can weigh up to 900 kilos, and as for length... The average maximum size for males is around 5 meters. However, the largest crocodile ever recorded was 6.2 meters, and this croc was killed by poachers in Papua New Guinea in 1983. It used to be thought that crocodiles would grow indefinitely until they died, hence producing very large, very old crocodiles. However, there's some doubt over this now. And it's likely that maximum size is instead influenced by inherited characteristics and by the environment. Few individuals seem predisposed towards very large sizes, even if all the conditions are right. Crocodiles are very sophisticated creatures. They can float or sink at will, finely tuning their buoyancy. In this way, they resemble a submarine. The liver is squeezed back to make more room for the expanded lungs. While submerged, they can stay under for up to two hours. A protective membrane closes over their eyes like swimming goggles. Crocodiles feed on a large variety of prey, such as small mammals, birds, and even domestic livestock. They have very strong jaws, but they don't chew their food. They swallow it in large chunks and it is broken down in the stomach. Crocodiles can go for long periods without eating. There are, in fact, numerous examples of the animals not feeding for a whole year. They become extremely thin, but they're still active and are perfectly capable of feeding when food appears. Some species of crocodile can even tolerate freezing temperatures. This is because a crocodile has a very sophisticated circulatory system, with a heart more like a mammal's than a reptile's. Before you hear the next part of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Because crocodiles look like logs of wood, people assume, wrongly, that they will behave in the same way. However, studies have shown that crocodiles are quite complex socially. Individuals know other individuals and have long-term relationships with each other. They also learn very rapidly how to avoid dangerous situations. Some species can also become quite tame. One crocodile biologist, Frederico Medem, described a doctor in Colombia who had an Orinoco crocodile. He had raised it from a baby. This crocodile was a female, about three meters long, and it played with the children and the family dog. Crocodiles of all species are threatened by many human activities. In the past, commercial over-exploitation by skin collectors and indiscriminate killing by frightened villagers have resulted in many species suffering drastic declines in numbers. But no species has become extinct because of human exploitation. However, what is most threatening the crocodile is destruction of its habitat. Because they are quite large animals, they require areas that are both large and diverse. And this brings them into conflict with local farmers and fishermen.
One conservation project which is working well is with Nile crocodiles in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Although the Nile crocodile is not listed as endangered, research suggests it should be. The number of nest sites has decreased by a third in the last 15 years. Fishermen destroy the nests, crocodile ranchers take their eggs, and also do not return enough juveniles to the wild, and there is now only one small part of the delta left where crocodiles can lay their eggs. To get data on the crocodiles in the area, researchers have measured, tagged, and taken blood samples from over 1,500 crocodiles, all without drugging the animals. They catch the crocodile by throwing a wet towel over its head. This is important, as a dry towel would come off too easily, thus allowing the crocodile time to escape. And they tie up its jaw with rubber bands. The animal is then released. Countries encountering a decrease in their crocodile population include Bangladesh, China, and Madagascar. Some other countries, such as Australia, have already taken steps to improve or create new habitats to positive effect. However, this has not always been the case elsewhere. The creation of dams and a new lakeshore has had little effect in Honduras and India because of drought or an increase in water use for agriculture. Zimbabwe, though, has seen an increase in numbers of its crocodiles because of expanded habitat. Too readily we have cast crocodiles as ruthless predators, feared them, misunderstood them, attacked and exploited them. But they are great survivors that go back more than 70 million years. We must do everything we can to make sure that crocodiles live on, looking and behaving much the same as they do today. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech to a group of volunteers preparing for a town's anniversary celebrations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. And now for the preparation plans for the town's 250th anniversary celebrations. We are going to follow the same system we had last year, but with a few changes to increase the party spirit. First of all, this time we are going to make the concert on the beach open to everyone without charge. This is because we have been given money by the council for the celebration, and also because last year we had so many problems with keeping people out who had not paid. And on top of this, people will not have to pay for refreshments either, as these are being donated. Right now, hmm, we are going to divide into four teams. The first one, the beach team, will be responsible for cleaning up the beach on the Saturday morning, picking up litter, bottles plastic bags, wood, and anything else that's lying around. Everyone is meeting at the beach shop at 8 a.m. It's an early start, but we want to give everywhere a good thorough clean. We have had permission from the council to close the beach to get it ready for the anniversary celebration on Sunday. The second team will be responsible for setting out seating in the square for the speeches and prize giving. Again, an early start is preferable, but the vans with the seats can't be there until 9am, 
So, shall we say that everyone should meet at the village hall at 9.30? Starting then, we'll allow extra time if the vans are late. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, the third team will be the judges. For each of the various competitions, we will have three judges. On the whole, they will have had experience of judging before. There will be a boat race, a swimming competition, and the best fancy dress. A cash prize will be given to the winner in each category, and for the two runners-up, there will be book tokens. There is a sponsored mini-marathon, and by the deadline, lunchtime today, we had 263 applicants, with ages ranging from 15 to 60. That's 80 more than last year. Each entrant has paid a £20 registration fee to enter, and all the profits will go to the local children's hospital to help fund much-needed specialist apparatus. The fourth team consists of the wardens for the day itself. We are expecting at least 10,000 people, if last year is anything to go by. The fields near the entrance to the beach can be used as car parks, and we need wardens to help make sure the actual parking is more organised than last year, which was a mess. We also need someone to be in charge of the first aid, which will be at the entrance to the beach. Finally, we need some volunteers for the clean-up. Last year we didn't do this very well, and so the council has agreed to provide large bags to collect all the recyclable material, like glass and plastic, etc. But we have to deal with the rest, like leftover food, ourselves. We don't want to leave piles of rotten food around or dangerous bottles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said... We need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? 
The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay. But it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture given by a coach. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Today I'm going to give all the new members of our league a brief introduction about our basketball league. We are a competitive league whose goal is to promote sportsmanship and good health. Founded in 1988 with 4 teams and 30 players, today we have grown to over 20 teams and 200 players. We will accept any player regardless of race or sex as long as they are a student at this school. There is no maximum age. As long as you are still fit, you can play but we do require all players meet the minimum age standard, which is 20 for woman and 18 for man. We expect the best behaviour out of all the players, whether male or female. Hopefully, you will all enjoy the upcoming season and make new friends with your teammates and coaches. Our final date of registration is October 11th.
If you have any friends or family that are still interested, don't forget to remind them to register by this date. After October 1, there is a late registration fee of $20 on top of the $200 membership fee. The membership fee includes a team uniform, gym usage fees, and referee fees. All the coaches in our league are volunteers, so please be respectful and don't yell at them if they don't know everything. Please attend your first team meeting on October 15. This will be an important event to get to know your teammates and coaches. The first practice is scheduled for October 18. Please call ahead if you know you can't make it. Our league schedule is as follows. There will be practice every Tuesday and Thursday and games every Saturday morning. This is gym time that is included in your membership fees. Your coaches and the rest of the team can arrange any extra practice times. Practices are from 7pm to 9pm and games are from 9am to 11am. Please plan on making all your practices and games. We realise that all the players are also mothers and fathers, students and workers, yet at the same time it takes commitment to create a good basketball team. There are some rules that everyone in the league must abide by. First, please be on time to your games. If your team is more than 10 minutes late, you will be forced to forfeit the game. Second, please wear appropriate basketball shoes for all practices and games, as shoes other than these may damage the gym floor. Third, be respectful to the referees. Any inappropriate actions or gestures will result in an ejection and a fine from the league. Last, the most important thing is to have a good time. If you are not enjoying yourself, then you are missing the point of basketball. See you all at the games next Saturday. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.